So we're going to talk about Melchizedek and who this man was. I have never, ever preached on Melchizedek. I have never studied him. This was a first for me, but it was a request. And I thought, well, let's just see what we can find out. So this is the result of my research. And uh, I found it very interesting, actually. He's only mentioned three different books of the Bible. We'll come back to these, but Genesis 14 is the first place he's mentioned. He gets a brief mention in Psalms 110. And then we get him mentioned several times in Hebrews, just say five through seven for the most part there, as the writer there is making an argument and brings Melchizedek in to help explain that. Uh, there's not a lot of information about him, though. He is pretty much a mystery. And when we get through, he's still going to be pretty much a mystery. But we will understand why he is in the Bible. Now, I don't have an answer to every question, but you will understand why he starts there in Genesis and he weaves through just a, a little bit. It is part of the tapestry of God, which is amazing in and of itself. I thought, let's do some quick facts on him. Nothing real profound here, but these are quick facts. He's only mentioned in three books of the Bible. That's all you're going to get. Most of it is going to be in the New Testament, as we will see. He is a contemporary of Abraham. He does not have a recorded family lineage, so we don't know anything about him, where he came from, who his parents were. We just, we just don't know. He was both a king and a priest, and we'll see that very, very clearly, which is a little different than a Levitical priesthood. He did bless Abraham. Actually, technically, it was Abram. He wasn't called Abraham yet. And he did receive a tithe from Abraham. And he is greater than Abraham. Now, we'll see that when we get to Hebrews 7, 7, where the writer makes the point quite clearly that that Melchizedek is greater. Let me leave it at that until we get there. So the first mention we get is over here in Genesis 14, 18 through 20. Melchizedek, the king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Now, he was priest of God most high. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God most high, who has handed over your enemies to you. And he gave him a tenth of everything. Now, we won't go into the backstory there, but Abraham had just come from a battle where he rescued Lot and, and freed Lot from his captors. So we want to just notice a couple of phrases here as we look at this passage. He is the king of Salem, and he is a priest of God most high. This is different than the Levitical priesthood, because the Levitical priest was a priest only, and then you had a separate king. Not real profound, but it does play in as part of the tapestry looking forward to the ultimate king and high priest. He brought out bread and wine. Now, pause there a second. I've got no explanation, but how many of you thought, hmm, that's kind of like the Lord's Supper, isn't it? Now, what you do with it beyond that, I'm just going to let you kind of ponder it. I take it as a bit of a foreshadow, but that's just my thinking. And then he is the king of Salem. Well, for most of us, unless you're really into the geographical history of the Bible, which I'm not, king of Salem uh, is commonly, without very much argument, Salem is the former name of, if you put J-E-R-U on the front of Salem, you got Jerusalem. And our scholars tell us that Salem and Jerusalem are the same place, just different names at different times. And that makes you go, hmm. That's kind of interesting too, isn't it? And then, of course, as a priest, he had blessed Abraham and he said, blessed be Abraham, which priests do that. They give blessings. And when we get over to Hebrews, this is going to be important to understand that the greater blesses the lesser and the lesser pays tithes to the greater, which we have down here. So if you want to flip ahead and look a minute at Hebrews 7, 7, you can see that stated there quite clearly. So as we look at our Old Testament text there where we're introduced to him that's pretty much it that's what we've got and this is part of the tapestry god put together in anticipation of the ultimate king that we were going to have so we have a priesthood that was 430 years before moses and aaron now to you and i we go okay so it was but i want you to try to see this from a hebrew point of view you were raised in a Jewish family. Your grandpa, your great-grandpa, so on and so forth, backwards, believed in the Levitical priesthood. It was the ultimate, the greatest, the most wonderful priesthood. You had a lot of pride and joy in that priesthood. And here we have God, through Moses, telling us, wait a minute, 
There was a priesthood before the priesthood of Moses. 430 years before there was another priesthood. And as we will see over in Hebrews 7, it was a superior priesthood. Kind of an interesting thought, isn't it? So we have pre-Moses worship in the Old Testament. It is obscure. Don't know a lot about it. Uh, we can go all the way back to uh, Cain and Abel. And why were they fussing? Because when they made their sacrifices, one was accepted and one wasn't. Now, so we know there are sacrifices. We can come up to Abraham and we understand that there's some sacrificing going on there. You may think of the time where Abraham offered Isaac. We know there was some moral code. You can you talk about Ur and Onan if you want to, or you can talk about Sodom and Gomorrah. So we know they had a system. We know there was this priest named Melchizedek. We know there was the concept of tithing. And we know there was some moral code, but we just don't, we don't have a lot. Now we get over to the Levitical priesthood, most of us get more information than we want to read, right? So you start reading the book of Leviticus and the book of Numbers, and you start looking at all the things they went through, and it's just like a little overwhelming. But before the Levitical priesthood, there was the order of Melchizedek. Obscure, not a lot of detail, but there was the order of Melchizedek, who was both a king and a priest. Then we get to our psalm passage. Now, Psalms 110 is only seven verses long, so I thought, well, I'm just going to read the whole thing. And I would encourage you, this is a Messianic psalm, go back and look at the whole thing and kind of sit on it for about ten minutes and, and just mull it over. The Lord said, now the Lord, that's Yahweh, all caps, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Lord will stretch forth your strong scepter from Zion saying, rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will volunteer freely in the day of your power and holy array from the womb of the dawn. Your youth are to you as the dew. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings in the day of his wrath. He will judge among the nations. He will fill them with corpses. He will shatter the chief men over a broad country. He will drink from the brook by the wayside. Therefore, he will lift up his head. And so here we have very clearly Messianic. He's going to be a priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, what is that order? Now, David's right in the middle of a time of the Levitical priesthood, right? And he says, wait a minute, there's coming one who's going to be of a different order. And that's really about all you're going to get from that. There is coming a priest who's going to be from the order of Melchizedek. He's not going to be from your Levitical priesthood. We get over to Hebrews, that's really clear. And so all the way back here, God is setting the stage just a little bit. And let's say it's a, a rather small thread in the tapestry. You know, you go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, you get the first prophecy where he says, your seed will crush his head and he will bruise your heel. And this is just another little thread. Okay, we have this Melchizedek, 430 years before the Levitical priesthood, and now we have this promise that there's a Messiah coming, and he is not going to be of the Levitical priesthood. He's going to be of the order of Melchizedek. What do we make of that? The best we can do is... It's not going to be Levitical. It's going to be different. He's going to be both a king and a priest. And that is Jesus, right? But the Levitical priesthood, they were only priests. And then you had kings from other areas. Then we get into our Hebrew text, and we have a whole lot to cover here. And this is, this is an academic sermon. I'm sorry, there's, there's not a lot of fun here. This is just a lot of crunching numbers, so to speak. So we, this is our first mention, just as he also says in another passage, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. That takes you back to Psalms 110. In the days of his humanity, he offered up both prayers and pleas with loud crying and tears to the one who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his devout behavior. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things he suffered. Having been perfected, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him being designated by God as high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, I know our English language might muddle that a little bit. You've got to go back in the context. Verse 7, where it says, In the days of his humanity, he's, now, he's talking about Jesus there. And so, 
he's using Melchizedek to point out that Jesus is a superior priest over the Levites. Now, you and I were like, well, yeah, but I want you to try to put yourself in Hebrew shoes. And you've got how many generations? Uh, you know, you may even count them going all the way back to Moses. They love their genealogies. And now here comes Christianity going, no, 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 wait. So you have to understand the, the argument of the book of Hebrews. And this, this is where, like I say, you just have to read it and sit with it and meditate on it and kind of marinate in it. When the Hebrew writer comes onto the scene, he is advocating the superiority of Christ over the Levitical priesthood, over the law of Moses. Now, there's no question about that. We'll make it clear as we go on. But it starts out in the very beginning. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions, in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his son, very important, right? Whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also made the world. That's awesome. Now, if you're making notes, jot down a little side note there. Gospel of John, chapter 1, probably verse 1 through 3 would be enough. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was God, the Word was with God. And you read on down there, it says, there was nothing made that was not made without Him. Here we have the same thing here. God made the world through Christ. Now, we're going to jump over here to Hebrews 3, 3, trying just to establish the theme, the line of thought. For he has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses. Now, again, you and I are going, well, of course. But try to imagine being a Hebrew of multiple generations where Father Abraham was highly revered, Moses highly revered, the Levitical priesthood was the priesthood, and now you're reading this Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses by just so much as the builder of the house is more honor than the house. So he's arguing the superiority of Jesus Let's take it one more time here in Hebrews 4, 8 through 9. For if Joshua had given them rest, he would not have spoken of another day after that. Consequently, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. So you remember Joshua, what did he do? He led the people into the promised land, and they conquered the promised land. And that, that was their thing. But that wasn't the whole plan. What we're seeing here is God had a bigger plan. Now, you and I know it now because we're thinking the church, the kingdom of God, and all that stuff. But this, this was radical back in the day. So you're a Jew, you've been raised in Judaism, and now here you're reading, wait a minute, Joshua didn't give him rest? No, he didn't. It wasn't the final plan of God. It was just a temporary plan, which we'll point out here in a moment. So now we're to Hebrews 6, 19. This hope we have is an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and reliable and one which enters within the veil where Jesus has entered as forerunner for of us, having become a priest forever. Here we have Melchizedek mentioned again according to the order of Melchizedek. So we had 430 years before Moses, we had a priesthood, which all that we know is we can call it the order of Melchizedek. Now I got that in scripture, so I know I can call it that. That's book, chapter, and verse. And 430 years later, when he takes the people out of captivity and takes them over to the promised land, he's under Moses, he gives them the Levitical priesthood, which is a different order. It is the order of Aaron. But our priest is not of the order of Aaron, but he's according to the order of Melchizedek. So he's not the Levitical priesthood. So he predates that by at least 400 years. 430, as one passage says. So... What we learn is that the Levitical priesthood, which is the one you and I always look at when we're reading the Old Testament, is not the only priesthood. It wasn't the only exclusive priesthood ever. There was a priesthood that preceded it that in chapter 7 the Hebrew writer is going to argue was superior to what came down through Abraham and what we would call the order of Aaron now. Okay, interesting stuff for you and I. For a Jew saying the Levitical priesthood was not the only priesthood ever, would be like, that's blasphemy almost right there. That is, what are you saying? Uh, and he's saying there's a superior order over that. So let's get into chapter 7. Uh, we're just picking parts, so you're going to have to go back and read it if you're really interested. He said he's without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days or end of life, but made like the Son of God who remains a priest perpetually. Now he's referring here to Melchizedek, and this is the passage that gets all our curiosity up. 
We're like, oh man, what is this? Is this literal or is this figurative language? And you're going to have to decide for yourself because there are people who take it as absolute literal, referring to Melchizedek. And then there's also a long tradition that we can trace back going all the way to almost the first century where it was not literal. In fact, in what we will call the folklore of old times, going back at least to the second century, you can find stories that tell you about who the daddy of Melchizedek was and who his mother was. And there's just an interesting story that's considered pretty much fictional or folklore about the unique circumstances of his birth. And basically, it's without going into the story, it's kind of an Abraham, Sarah, and Isaac story. Is basically what it would line up with there. So what, what do you do with this? No, no father, no mother. Well, the Jewish culture was extremely tied to their genealogy. In fact, we know that when the Jews came out of captivity and went back to rebuild Jerusalem, if a priest could not establish his right to the priesthood through his genealogy, they sent him to the curb. And they said, no, you, you can't serve right now. We've got to figure out what to do with you. So this in the Jewish culture, having your lineage established and knowing where you came from was extremely important. And so the common idea is that the order of Melchizedek didn't concern your genealogy. A Levitical priest had to be born into the line of Aaron. Melchizedek didn't have to be born into a particular line. So the Levites, they were born into it. It didn't matter what kind of person they were. They were born into it. You're a Levite. You're this and this tribe within the Levitical tribe. And this is what you're going to do in the story. That's your assignment. And then they had other rules that said you can't start. Now, there's a little variation here. But basically, you can't start till you're 30. And you have to retire when you're 50. And so the common approach to this is when we talk about Melchizedek being without father and mother, no genealogy, just, just means that. His genealogy was irrelevant. That wasn't what his priesthood was based on. And having neither beginning of days or end of life, if you want to take that literal, then we've got a little different way to go. But the idea of not having to retire at a certain age, but had a perpetual priesthood, is the common idea the scholars are going to take you into. And so the comparison here is Jesus was not under such limits as the Levitical priest were either. Jesus didn't have to give up his priesthood when he was 50. He continues to be a priest. And there's a lot of things you can kind of kick around there and you can kind of go, yeah, but what about, what about? Uh, and you know, the Melchizedek, he is a foreshadow, an anti-type of Christ. But genealogy is not a problem there with Christ, is it? Because what do you have in Matthew chapter 1? A uh, big old long genealogy, don't you? And what do you have over, I believe it's Luke 3. A uh, big old long genealogy, right? And so, I wish there was a definitive statement I could give you and say, boom, this, this locks it in. It's figurative. I can't. Language just has that flexibility. And I can't lock it in the other way either. I can just tell you what the common scholarly approach has been for the last 2,000 years, and that is to put it into the figurative category. I will mention that again one more time. So the Levites, they weren't the best priesthood ever. So he says, if perfection was through the Levitical priesthood, for on the basis of it the people received the law, what further need was there for another priest to arise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be designated according to the order of Aaron. So you see what we've got going? We have two different orders. There's the order of Melchizedek, right? And then there's the order of Aaron. And so our argument is the order of Melchizedek is superior to the order of Aaron, which is where our high priest fits in. The Levitical priesthood was temporary by God's design. Now, we can see that very clearly in a moment. We will on our next slide where Paul just point blank says it in Galatians 3, 17, 19. Now, for a further study there, I would just start at Galatians 2. I'll go ahead and start at 1, no problem there. And take it through about chapter 5, uh, maybe just verse 4 of chapter 5. And there's where Paul is making the argument that the old law was temporary. It's over, it's done. So here is the 
key text in the Galatians passage. Paul says, what I'm saying is this, the law which came 430 years later. 430 years later than what? Than the promise made to Abraham and 430 years after Melchizedek. So you got Melchizedek, Abraham, the promise and all of that. 430 years before Moses ever came on the scene, he says the law that came 400 years later, 30, does not invalidate the covenant previously ratified by God, that's the one with Abraham, as to nullify the, nullify the promise. For if the inheritance is based on law, it's no longer based on promise, but God has granted it to Abram by means of a promise. Why then the law? You got your promise? 430 years before the law. Why did we need the law? Paul says, it was added on account of the violations. Having been ordered through angels at the hand of a mediator until the seed would come to whom the promise had been made. Pretty much point blank answer there, isn't it? So let's get back to Hebrews. So we're in Hebrews 7 now. For when the priesthood is changed, of necessity there takes place a change of the law also, for the one about whom these things are said belong to another tribe, from which no one has officiated at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord descended from the tribe, or from Judah, a tribe with reference to which Moses said nothing concerning the priest. Christ cannot be, is not, of the Aaron order. He's of... Melchizedek's order, a different tribe entirely. And this, this is, you know, like I, the distinction, you know, like we'd like to talk about the difference between the Old Testament and New Testament. And this, this really nails it down as you marinate on this and, and digest it and you think about it. And this is clear. If another priest arises according to the likeness of Melchizedek, there he is again, who has become a priest not on the basis of law of physical requirements, so this, didn't, this wasn't based on genealogy and being part of the right lineage, but according to the power of an indestructible life, for it is tested to him, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Now that's a challenging concept for the Jews. You and I are going to get it way quicker. But the Jews are like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. He can't be a priest. He's not of the tribe of Levi. Well, the Hebrews writer is saying, you're right. Didn't you read Psalm 110 and 4 where he said there's going to be a new priest? According to the order of Melchizedek, you shouldn't be looking for your new priest in the Levitical line. You should be looking outside the Levitical line. Now, it's just a little snippet, though, isn't it? Psalm 110 and 4. It's not really deep, but it's there. And the Hebrew writer is making all kinds of use of it. So, for on the one hand, there is the nullification of a former commandment because of its weakness and uselessness, for the law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, there's the introduction of a better hope through which we come near. Now, better hope is the order of Melchizedek, but let's walk through this one a second, because the Hebrew writer is going, no, 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 the Levitical law, that wasn't a permanent thing. So I have it highlighted. We're going to walk through this one. There's the nullification of a former commandment. Amen. There was a change of law with a change of priesthood. Because of its weakness and uselessness, why did we have a new order, a new priesthood? Why did we get rid of the Levitical priesthood? Because of its, read it with your own eyes, weakness and uselessness. For the law made nothing perfect. Now, that is New American Standard, so if you're reading a different version, you may get a slightly different wording, but the message of Hebrews is really clear. You need to get over your fascination with being a Levite and, and claiming your genealogical thing. On the other hand, there is an introduction of a better hope which, through which we come near to God. How do you go near to God? James 4, 8, draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. Do you do it through the Levitical priesthood? No. The Hebrew writer is saying we have a better hope. Better than what? Better than that nullification commandment thing. It was weakless and useless. We want to get rid of it. We want to build on the order of Melchizedek of which Christ is of that order. And so we go to Hebrews 8, 6, where he says, but now he obtained a more excellent ministry. Well, amen, of course, no problem to you and I, but to the Hebrew Jews, it would be like, whoa, 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 what are you saying? I'm saying he obtained a more excellent ministry. 
to the extent that he's also the mediator of a better covenant. Thus, we have the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, and the New Covenant. Which one's better? The New Covenant, which has been acted on better promises. And he says, look how point blank this is. If that first covenant had been free of fault, the no place, let me back up, the no place would have been sought for a second. Why did we need a second one? Because the first one was weak and useless. It had faults. And the fault basically was it made nothing perfect, to use the language that we just looked at. So we're going to sum it up. <laughs> I know, didn't answer every question, but this is where we're going to leave it. Melchizedek is an argument for the superiority of the priesthood of Christ. He is a priesthood that preexisted the Levitical priesthood. That's very clear. He is a priest of the Most High God. He is king and priest. Psalms 110 tells us that's the priest, the Messianic priest we're looking for, is of the order of Melchizedek outside the Levitical priesthood. And so basically what we have is Melchizedek being a foreshadow, antitype of Jesus, which doesn't mean that you have to have exactly every detail paralleled. Noah and the ark, commonly argued as being a foreshadow or an antitype of the church. No problem. Wait a minute, does every detail line up exactly? No, that's not what antitypes and foreshadows do. And so you, you go back and you look at it and go, okay, I, I'll take that. He was a king and priest separate in part from Moses and the Levitical priesthood, and it preceded it by 430 years. There's something different going on. God had another plan, and that's where he started weaving this thread in. Just real short, Genesis. Then it pops back up there in Psalms 110. Then it disappears, and then it comes back in in the book of Hebrews. So, what was he? This is the last slide. Actually, there's one more after this, but it's just my closing. Melchizedek, depending on how you take that one verse in, in Hebrews, what was that, 7-3 or was that 6-3? He's either a supernatural being who literally had no mama and literally had no daddy, literally had no beginning and no end, in which case you get a member of the Godhead on earth reigning as king over Jerusalem, Salem, and, and acting as a priest. I can't tell you you're wrong, but I just don't feel that that's the right answer. There's a little nuances there that we could get into, but our time is up. The other one is you have a regular human serving as king and priest without regulations like the Levites had. You just had a priest that was a contemporary of Abraham who was of a superior order than the Levitical priesthood. No. Now you get to go home. Let me do my last one. Now you get to go home and you get to figure it out for yourself. I don't know if that even whetted your appetite or not, but that's everything we can know. Now, if you want to go deeper, go back to Hebrews, start at chapter 1, and start following the line of argument. And when you get to 5, 6, and 7, you can go a little deeper. And uh, that would be three or four weeks in a Wednesday night class. So we're going to call it there. I don't know what you want to do with Melchizedek. I'm, I'm going to leave him at a foreshadow, and I'm going to be happy with that myself. And if somebody else wants to think there's something more there, I'm not going to argue with it, because when we're all said and done, whoever Melchizedek was, your role and my role is still to follow Jesus. He's my king, he's my Lord, and I'm supposed to observe whatsoever he commanded. And so my conclusions about Melchizedek don't change anything about me or you being a disciple of Christ.